Welcome to Conversations with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is James Mann. James Mann is author in residence at Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies. For many years, he was a diplomatic correspondent uh, and the foreign affairs columnist for the Los Angeles Times. He is the author most recently of The Rise of the Vulcans, The History of Bush's War Cabinet. His other book, two books were on China, uh, and uh, the second of those books was About Face, A History of America's Curious Relationship with China from Nixon to Clinton. James, welcome to Berkeley. Good to be with you, Harry. Good. Where were you born and raised? I was born in, and grew up in, in Albany, New York. Uh huh. And looking back, how do you think uh, your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Um, I grew up in front, uh, I had a family of doctors. My father was a doctor, my grandfather was a doctor. Uh, I think I was, I was um, supposed to and sort of started to volunteer to become a doctor as well. Uh, and uh, uh, my father shaped my values in many ways. Uh, he, he died when I was about 16. Um, I got midway through, through college. I'd taken the bare minimum pre-med courses. I actually even applied to and got into medical school. And I finally got to that point where I said, you know, I like to write. I really don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided uh, to, to try um, newspaper reporting. And I went and got a job as a newspaper reporter. Uh, my medical school, I think the next year asked, I'd, I'd taken a leave of absence. Again, I, I hadn't even started. Are you coming? And at some point, they stopped asking if I was coming. Hmm. And, and uh, I, I kept on as a newspaper reporter for many years. And, and you haven't regretted it since? Not. This is what I wanted to do, yeah. And where did you do your undergraduate work? Th this, I was an undergraduate at Harvard. Uh, and then, you know, this first leave of absence was is in one of uh, not America's finest newspapers, uh, a small newspaper in New Haven, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for about nine months. I remember um, quitting uh, in June because I was 22 years old and people didn't, you know, school was out. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then later, you know, at the end of that summer started as I think the youngest uh, cub reporter in the newsroom of the Washington Post in about 1969. Mm -hmm. And and what what uh, how did you uh, make this match with writing? Did you just discover it through courses, through reading? What 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 what, what led you to that? I think there's a part in in different ways for any writer. There's a um, there are parts of that that are just a a. Um, in both an instinct and a desire that you have. I know that, that as, a, as a kid, I, I like to write, I like to write letters, I edited my high school newspaper, mm -hmm. and so on. It's just something you, you know, you like telling stories and you like putting ideas down on paper and um, you just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. for, for many years you were the uh, diplomatic and uh, correspondent and the foreign affairs columnist for the uh, 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 Los Angeles time what what is unique about uh, that beat does it require a set of skills that are different than police reporting say um, there's some some things that are common to all reporting um, a, a, a need for curiosity to get beyond the surface uh, a need to f the need to know how to ask questions to, to ask follow-up questions. There are things that are, are particular to the diplomatic beat. I had been, I became a diplomatic correspondent after I'd been a foreign correspondent in China. I'd lived in, and worked in China mm -hmm. for three years. Uh, this was in the late, mid, mid to late 80s. And while I was there, uh, I was reading my own paper every day and I noticed something that should have been evident even before I left, which is that all of the coverage of American foreign policy out of Washington in my newspaper and many others, mm -hmm. uh, all others just about, centered on two things. Coverage from Moscow mm -hmm. of Soviet policy and coverage in the Middle East. This is very understandable. But here I was working for the LA Times, uh, the main and biggest newspaper west of the Mississippi, uh, with uh, large and growing Asian American communities uh, large and growing interests in Asia, 
And every once in a while, I'd pick up uh, uh, regional publications like the Far Eastern Economic Review, and I'd find stories coming out of Washington um, that you couldn't find in the, in the American, what we would, I guess people would call mm. the mainstream press. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I came back to Washington, um, after my, my tour in China, I said, look, you know, we should be covering uh, dipl American diplomacy, but not just, uh, not just Moscow and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. How about Asia? And, and actually, at the time, this was about 1988 or so, the newspaper was a little bit resistant. I mean, why do we need to do that? But they, they accommodated me. Mm -hmm. um, and I spent several years really um, doing what really people on the, the State Department, the National Security, the Foreign Policy Beats hadn't done before, which was to look at um, American relations with China, Japan, hmm. uh, not as kind of a, a, a sideshow that you checked in on once in a while if there was nothing going on um, in Jerusalem, but as really the, the main part of the coverage. Um, and it worked. It worked because the, the LA Times, once you brought in the stories, um, was intensely interested. And really, uh, that, that got me started. What's, what's unique about the beat, I guess, is that um, not only are American diplomats, particularly State Department officials, close-mouthed, Mm -hmm. In some ways, they don't even know how to talk mm -hmm. um, in, about policy. Uh, they're really, uh, they tend to see the press as getting in the way of what, of, of what they're doing, which is to smooth over relations with, with um, another country or to um, make what might be unpalatable a little bit more palatable. And, and, uh, the press, by, by making things public, by, call, by putting words, uh, by, by calling things uh, 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 by their real names, mm -hmm. um, tends to make their jobs more difficult. And that's, that's unique, of course, to the, the diplomacy beat. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, when I started doing this program 20 plus years ago, one of my first guests was Tom Wicker mm -hmm. in the early 80s, and, and he, uh, uh, at that time was kind of interested in looking at American patriotism and journalism. And because the, the immediate question that actually comes to my mind, <laughs> thinking back to that interview, is to what extent do you find uh, conflicts that arise on the one hand, your responsibility as a journalist, but on the other hand, you know, your, whatever concerns and, or feelings you have as a citizen of the United States and so on. Does, does that arise, namely the, the kinds of things you may need to report on uh, 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 that might, you know, uh, affect the way the policy is being shaped and, and be detrimental, or the argument could be made, well, this is detrimental to, to U.S. policy. Because one, one of the things that I think, one, as I listen to you, one of the things, these people may think they know what they're doing, and they don't want to be on, uh, uh, you know, in the democratic arena, so to speak, debating the choices that are before them. Yeah, you know, I rarely found it a, as a conflict, but I have to say the reason I didn't find it as a uh, find it to be a conflict is that I never defined my job as as to serve U.S. policy. Yeah. If something, if if an official said this is detrimental to U.S. policy, um, that that really uh, my, my I may not I may not have said this in an interview, but mm. my what I thought to myself is. It's not my job. My yeah. job is to, to tell people what U.S. policy is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, that, you know, there are, there are several points where I would um, uncover things people did not want to be known. I can think, for example, in, in covering um, China, uh, I remember in the, about 1992, um, coming across and then confirming the fact um, that China had sold uh, missiles, some of its missiles, to Pakistan. This is now a, a long forgotten mm -hmm. incident, but it consumed American policy in, in the uh, early 90s. And mm -hmm. I don't know how many times I had officials for, for months deny that that was mm -hmm. the case. It wasn't true. Uh, it, the evidence wasn't clear and on and on. It, it took about nine months um, 
uh, and the, to the point where uh, Congress was holding hearings and where they couldn't really dissemble anymore to acknowledge that that was true. Well, I just felt, you know, it, this was, the argument was made, um, this uh, harms American relations with China. Well, um, it wasn't my job to improve American relations with China. Mm -hmm. and, and is this a, a, a sensibility that extends throughout the, 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 the community that had the same beat as you, do you think? I mean, were you an exception, or uh, do, you, do you think many of your colleagues were uh, just as firm in their convictions about the ethics of, of their role? I think, I think most of them were, and, and really the, the differences that I saw within the regular, the regular press, well, there, there are two differences. Mm -hmm. First was between uh, people who were covering American foreign policy day in and day out and those who would come in occasionally. They mm -hmm. inevitably had a different perspective. Uh, I mean, in in-house journalist terms, sometimes they'd say uh, they'd, they'd want to discover something new that had been written about day in and day out. I ha inevitably had the perspective of, of one of the people who was, who was there every day. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, there were differences between people who were allowed, uh, had the freedom, or you can call it the luxury, as I did, to spend some time, whether it was a mm -hmm. week or two or three, working on a particular story versus those who were really necessarily chained to the daily stories. I'm thinking of, of wire service reporters. And so the divisions with, that I saw within the diplomatic uh, core were less over issues of, of patriotism or attitudes towards the U.S. government than they, were, than they were journalistic between daily reporters, people who had time, mm -hmm. and so on. Do you, do you think, uh, I know you don't, you, you're, you're, you're now a, an author full time. H have things changed a lot in the relationship between uh, the press and the government in the foreign policy field? You know, I, I'm not sure that they've changed that much. Um, one of the things I see written about the current uh, Bush administration. We haven't gotten to it. I know that's mm. the subject of my book. But one of the things I see bandied about is that it's more closed uh, with information than any I administration in the past. And there's an extent to which that's true. There's an extent, having been around through several administrations, four or five of them, the, the, uh, the, to which I react against that and say, actually, that's not true. I mean, mm -hmm. in this current administration, what, what's closed is, is direct access to um, daily developments. Um, but in a larger sense, for this administration, I'll give you the contrast in a second, this administration has been so deeply divided about its foreign policy in a number of areas, those divisions are right out there mm -hmm. for people to, to, uh, to see. I mean, there's nothing hidden about the fact that people in the Pentagon or um, have some different, you know, different views than people in the State Department. And those differences are reflected in the coverage. Well, I'll give you the contrast, just to show you that, that not much has changed. Um, I covered the first Bush administration, uh, and Meaning uh, the president's father. That's correct. Yeah, correct. yeah let's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, George George H. W. Bush, or we can call him Bush Forty One. Yeah. Um, and then I later wrote, I've written two books that covered events in that administration. And in each each case, uh, you know, five ten years later, I've found really vicious, nasty debates, say between the Secretary of State. Mm. Uh, James Baker and the National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft, or between the then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney and Baker, that we never knew about. Mm -hmm. Just play, it never came to light because they were better even at covering up their disagreement, better at, at covering things up than this current administration. Mm -hmm. and, but they covered up their internal differences as well. Uh, so that's a, it's a different kind of covering up. Um, but they were in, in some ways better than this administration. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about uh, uh, the current administration. And your book is called The Rise of the Vulcans, The History of Bush's uh, War Cabinet. Uh, so tell us, who are the Vulcans? <laughs> um, I, sh I guess I should explain the word uh, first. Uh, because it ha uh, in, the, in the sense that I mean it, it has nothing to do with Star Trek. 
Um, when it's very important in Berkeley. Uh, when George W. Bush was first running for president in the late 1990s, um, his own, well, first Bush himself, Mrs. Bush Jr. at the time, had no experience in foreign policy. Um, I think, I mean, he had been, he was governor of Texas, he had made trips to Mexico and so on, but he didn't, he didn't try and claim that he had a lot of foreign policy experience. And when people would criticize his lack of experience, his response was, um, I have a really experienced group of advisors. Uh, and in fact, he had surrounded himself with uh, veterans of previous Republican administrations, most of them from his own father's administration. Uh, but he'd assembled a team of foreign policy advisors who'd worked um, in the Bush, Reagan, or even going back to the Ford and Nixon administrations. And they would meet regularly, and they, they gave themselves the name the Vulcans. It's kind of an obscure name. What, why Vulcans? Well, the, the, the uh, main advisor, the person coordinating all this, um, although she was not the senior person by any means, uh, was Condoleezza Rice. Uh, Rice had grown up in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham was a steel town, and overlooking the city mm -hmm. is this huge statue of Vulcan, the, the Roman god of the forge. And so for some reason, they just called themselves the Vulcans. Well, who were they? Uh, and, I, and I, in writing this book then, took this name Vulcans to apply not just to the, the few people who were in this meeting, but the whole class of people who were Republican foreign policy hands and had worked in several different administrations. And the six that I profile in this book uh, are uh, Dick Cheney, the Vice President, um, Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, his deputy, Colin Powell, who was Secretary of State in the uh, first George W. Bush administration, his deputy, uh, Richard Armitage, and who have I left out? Uh, and Condi Rice. Condi, and Were Condi you? Rice, yes. So, so the, I guess the first question that, that, uh, or, that comes to mind is this. The, uh, is there a great discontinuity when this group comes to power? Or I, I get the sense in reading your book that there really are a lot more continuities than we realize. Talk a little about that because uh, the event 9-11 brought into focus a whole new set of policies. But what you're suggesting here as you trace the histories and the, and the biographies of these people is they, they were in, engaged in earlier conflicts, took positions that, that come up to the present today and, and influence the way they think today. Right. I, try, I describe the interactions among these six over several different administrations. And I, I think really to understand this group of, of people, you need to look at the continuities that really start that go all the way back to the 1970s, mm -hmm. to the aftermath of the Vietnam War. And the way I look at it, and I try to trace this through in the book, you get, um, as the America comes out of Vietnam, Vietnam, there are three different answers, three different schools of thought of how the United States should respond. Um, the first would be the, which, you know, centered on, on uh, Demo Democrats, liberal Democrats, uh, and it really was the mainstream in Congress in the 1970s, is that uh, Vietnam has shown that there need to be new limits um, on American power. Uh, George McGovern said, come, ho come home, America. Uh, Mike Mansfield, the Senate Majority Leader, is talking about bringing troops home from Germany. Other Democrats are saying bring troops home from Korea. There need to be, uh, in fact, the, the, the committees we see today governing the intelligence agencies, the Senate and House Intelligence Committees, those were set up by the Democrats in the 70s. Uh, we, we need to impose limits on American power. Uh, America has been weakened by Vietnam. The second school uh, is really the dominant one in the, Rep in the Republican Party all through the 1970s. It's represented by Richard Nixon, who was president uh, at, uh, at the time of the Vietnam War, and Henry Kissinger, uh, known 
uh, particularly in, in academia and places like this as, as the realists, but their response to Vietnam is um, we have to do what we can to prevent those liberals in Congress from bringing American troops home from overseas. We have to preserve America's uh, overseas position and the way to do that we need to, to work out an accommodation with the Soviet Union, one that will establish some process where the United States, within limits, can maintain its overseas presence. And they're the architects of detente with the Soviet Union. Those are the two dominant schools through the 70s, the Democrats uh, and the realists in, among the Republicans. Um, and then there's this third school, and this is the continuity with the present. Uh, in each of those parties, in each of the two main parties, Hmm. you get a disaffected group of people saying, whose response to Vietnam is, no, um, what we really need to do is rebuild America's military power. Uh, we don't have to cut back, we shouldn't cut back. Um, they're strongly opposed to detente with the Soviet Union. Um, and this group of people um, include uh, people in the, in the Democratic Party like Henry Jackson and his assistant, Richard Pearl, um, and a whole bunch of Republicans. At the end of the 1980s, this uh, uh, Ronald Reagan runs for president and very skillfully brings the disaffected Democrats over to the Rep Republican Party, creates a new majority. Uh, this would be in the 80s. This, yes. was, this is in, in, 19, in 81 and, and in the election before that. Um, and the people we have uh, in this second Bush administration today, all, uh, and the, the people I call the Vulcans, all really came of age in this period, in the 70s uh, and early 80s. And they all, in one way or another, are reacting against, uh, they're, they're, uh, they end up in the Republican Party and they're all reacting against either the congressional tide to pull back um, or to reach an accommodation with the Soviet Union. And I trace through these, this history in the book, and I try to, to extract from it three or four common attitudes um, that the Vulcans have had over the years. Uh, and one of them is an, an emphasis on the importance of military power. The, I mean, these aren't people who are interested in, in uh, I mean, military power is, is the main goal and main approach uh, main tactic. This isn't a matter of, of institution building. Military power is, is, a, is, is um, just preeminent. So, so th this would be, to, to clarify this more, this would be people who are not interested in the international world court, or not interested in the, uh, the Kyoto round. They, they really want to uh, rely on what America can do and uh, uh, and especially with military power. That's all correct. I would, I would add, I mean, from, you know, in, in their thinking, um, it doesn't work. They would mm -hmm. say, uh, 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 what we would call the, the um, well, the United Nations, but, uh, but international institutions um, can't succeed in, in achieving America's goals. Mm -hmm. um, and there are several other um, common attitudes of, of the, the Vulcans. Uh, one is a real skepticism of accommodation with another country. Mm -hmm. uh, no need for an accommodation um, unless it clearly achieves America's goals. So they're opposed to detente just as they're opposed to uh, uh, working out a United Nations solution 20 or 30 years later to dealing with, with uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, they tend to invoke America's ideals, uh, to link ideals to military power. Uh, one of the main critiques in the 70s of, um, of Nixon's detente with the Soviet Union is it didn't reflect America's ideals. And then the fourth one, which is, is least of all recognized, um, there is, apart from questions of how much, how much uh, military or economic power America should have or how it should use it, there is a factual question, an issue always out there, of just how much power does the United States have mm -hmm. uh, at any given time. Uh, 
there's a famous book written in the 1980s, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, by Paul Kennedy, arguing that countries can be, uh, great powers can become overstretched and, uh, and then weakened and decline. Um, this group of people tends to take a very expansive view of how much power the United States has. Mm -hmm. And that's been a, con a, a consistent theme over the years. Mm -hmm. Now, now there, in, in, in your book, there, it strikes me that, uh, uh, and it's a very rich book, that there are two threads that, that uh, are very important and I would like to bring out. And, and again, we're, we're cutting into this history selectively. Uh, and, and the first issue is uh, what you do with all of this power after the Soviet Union collapses. The main bipolar adversary is gone. And there is this discussion in the Pentagon at the end of uh, W.H. Bush's administration, uh, uh, and it, it involves a, a Pentagon guidance document uh, that comes up with an idea or a set of ideas about, well, where are we now and how should we shape the world? Talk a little about that, because that, that document well, seems the Yeah, go ahead, please. It's one of the most uh, little recognized uh, and, and crucial junctures in the history of modern history of American foreign policy. Um, when the Berlin Wall comes down, suddenly Washington, and when I say Washington, it you know, sounds impersonal, but we're talking about um, the White House, the Pentagon, the State Department, are faced with a sudden dilemma. The uh, rationale for America's huge deployments of troops overseas, its huge defense budget, um, has been the Cold War. Now the Cold War is coming to an end. Within days of the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, Democrats in Congress are talking about um, a peace dividend. And I, I don't mean to put this just off on Democrats in Congress. If you go back to the newspapers of the time, they're filled with, okay, now, um, now we don't need this huge defense budget. Shall we put the money in education? Shall we put the money in housing? And you proceed we, over, if you look back at this period, as I did, uh, and I'll get to the Vulcan's role in this in a second, you see a, an unfolding series of rationales for why the United States should preserve this defense budget. The first one, uh, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I'll use um, Dick Cheney, who was, I mean, obviously now the Vice President, then the Defense Secretary is kind of the bellwether. Uh, he, he took the lead on, on much of this. Uh, the first rationale is um, the Soviet Union is still a very powerful country and can still threaten American interests. Uh, so Cheney says, you know, Gorbachev, all, what he's doing is he's revitalizing the Soviet Union. It can improve its technology and its military technology. It can still be a threat. Get about six months, 12 months down the road, and that, that rationale begins to, I mean, uh, you, you get a series of uh, further summits with Gorbachev, and it, uh, that, that rationale and, and Soviet troops are beginning to be withdrawn from Eastern Europe. That rationale doesn't, doesn't work, and Cheney comes up with a new one, and it is uh, uh, the United States needs to preserve its, uh, its deployments. It's threatened not by s the strength of the Soviet Union, but by its weakness. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, strength didn't work as a rationale. And now the question is, well, what if the Soviet Union breaks up, falls apart, and uh, you, know, the, the, you have warring armies, or all, all kinds of scenarios he throws out. Well, after a while, that seems less and less. The United States um, takes a piece of that argument and starts then, and in a strand of policy that continues today, begins to worry about the Soviet nuclear arsenal and different pieces of that. But as a general rationale for America's defense budget, it doesn't work. Um, and then you get, uh, the next step is people begin to think about, well, what if you, you get what I would call World War II revisited? Mm -hmm. uh, and the Pentagon begins drafting a document that says the policy of the United States is to pre prevent the emergence of a rival 
in Europe or Asia. And it didn't take a lot for people to understand they were talking about Japan and Germany. And uh, this leaks, and there's, you know, people, uh, when the story leaks to the press, people um, begin to say, well, wait a minute, these are two of America's leading allies. Uh, why are we doing this? So finally, you get step four. And the key figures on this uh, are, this is, these documents are being drafted um, by Cheney's undersecretary, by the, by the staff of Paul Wolfowitz, who's serving as, as Cheney's uh, undersecretary of defense. Um, they rewrite this document, and it says this. It says, the United States will maintain such a, a, a strong military um, that it, it will preserve what's called its strategic depth. This was a very funny phrase. What that meant, as they spelled it out, was the United States would maintain such military power that no nation could compete with it now or in the future, that, that the leader of some unknown government would be virtually out of his mind to try to compete with the United States, meaning you know, it would take 30 years, and even then it wouldn't work, and you'd bankrupt your country. Um, and this document, which was uh, uh, published at, just as the first Bush administration left office, becomes really the blueprint for American um, defense policy after the end of the Cold War. Um, it's never directly countered by the Democrats, and certainly when the, the new Bush administration takes office, it becomes the, the blueprint for defense policy after 2001. And, and in, a, in a way, this document is, is responding, uh, it is a rationale, as you say, but it is responding uh, uh, to the fact that there is no adversary or group of adversaries who can balance our power. And, and in fact, during the, the, the Clinton administration, rather than substantially cutting back, you get a, a continuous tick upward in terms of uh, investment in the military, uh, producing what has come to be called a revolution in military affairs. You point out, I think, toward the end of your book, you say that in a way, once we go to Afghanistan and Iraq in the second Bush administration, that unilateralism wasn't just a choice, it was also inevitable uh, a result of the fact that nobody could match or complement our military technology. That's, Talk a little about that's that. That's exactly right. One thing we've, we've left out, um, or that I've passed over uh, in the 1990s is, is um, because we're focusing on Republican administrations, but you, you have uh, the Clinton administration's military interventions in Bosnia and, and Kosovo. Uh, and I should, you know, again, I should point out the continuities here. People forget that you mm -hmm. know, when, when the Clinton administration intervenes in, in Kosovo, it, um, it doesn't go to the United Nations to get UN approval mm -hmm. because it knows that the, the Russians will veto it. Um, so you, you don't have. Um, you know, you have intervention without UN approval there. But uh, more importantly, uh, those uh, uh, military interventions are carried out under NATO auspices, uh, and uh, the Clinton administration finds it's remarkably cumbersome that in order to decide uh, what to do for the military to decide what to do today. You, ha um, you have to have uh, meetings with uh, the 15 or whatever NATO countries. Um, and it, it's almost like the, 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 the uniformed military feels it's almost like conducting war by committee. And so this provides the, the, the subtext when, it, when it's time for the United States I say it's time, but in the, in the immediate heated aftermath of September 11th, uh, when the Bush administration is thinking of intervening uh, moving into Afghanistan, it's not just the civilians and the military. In fact, it's the, the uniformed leadership of the military that's saying, we don't want to do this with the Europeans. And in fact, I quote in my book, the, the French, uh, go, French go not to, uh, this isn't just uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice, the National Security Advisor, or, or, or Rumsfeld, they go directly to Tampa, to the uniformed military command, and say, what can we do to help? Mm -hmm. uh, and 
uh, they're told, you know, listen, thanks, but no thanks. Now, in, you know, I want to, you know, in fairness to the American uniform military, they're suddenly being asked to, you know, s um, s produce, to project power into areas they never have before and to do so quickly, and they, they feel they're swamped. But one way or another, this isn't just a matter of, of a couple of people at the top of the Bush administration being unilateral. This goes right down through the uniform military mm -hmm. on this one. And, and this was, you, the, what you're talking about is a response to a French offer to help in Afghanistan right. uh, after 9-11. Uh, after, uh, now, interestingly enough, the, the other piece of this, because what I think you're, you're demonstrating in your book and in our conversation here is the way the American foreign policy system, in a way, has moved forward through time with a lot more continuity that, that we tend to realize. And, but one, one of the, uh, if we go back to this Pentagon guidance document, what we're left with is there wasn't public support for this effort to define our role in the world uh, uh, as one to deter the arise, uh, prevent the rise of a, of a countering uh, power, either a group of power in, in any region that could dominate that region and then possibly threaten our global power. It wasn't popular. And so they, although they, they, they had to change the language and in a way put it in the drawer, uh, uh, so what if, if we fast forward then to after 9/11, after the 2004 election, it would seem that this, this 2001, act, uh, yeah. the 2000, yeah, well, 2000 but, election. But yeah. the 2000, no, I mean the most recent election, okay. the yeah. 2004. That what we see is that this terrorist act against our soil created, it appears, a new consensus where the the, the Pentagon do guidance document. Uh, of, of 92 in a way is no longer in question, correct? I mean, if, if you look at public support for the president in the 2004 election. Yeah, I guess it's hard for me. The public support for the president in the, two, in the 2004 election is, is a 51% support. That's right. a remarkable difference from from 2000 and from the 2000 election, yes. but it's still hard to talk about a, a consensus. Right, it's a, it's a hard Con consensus, but, but in other words, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that in a way that in responding to Iraq, uh, the, 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 the Vulcans actually implemented or, or were guided by this 92 Pentagon guidance statement and, and just sort of walked into a response that in a way was defined by that document. I think that's right. Yeah. Could I, let me just come back yeah. to one on this, on this issue of continuities yeah. and, and, and uh, unilateralism did not start mm -hmm. after uh, 2001. Let me come back to, since we were talking about my experience as a diplomatic correspondent. Mm -hmm. um, during, the, during the 1990s, I, mean, I, uh, I had, uh, among the other things you do as a diplomatic correspondent, you work closely alongside uh, correspondents from other countries. Um, I had a couple of good friends uh, in the Washington Press Corps who had been with me uh, in China from publications in France and Germany. Uh, and I was well aware and watched all through the 1990s uh, their complaints, uh, uh, sometimes quite valid, that the United States was acting unilaterally. This was uh, all. This is in the Clinton years. People, uh, you know, there tends to be a a sort of romanticism now about the multilateralism of the Clinton years. But I can tell you from when I was covering it um, that you know at the time uh, people were complaining about American unilateralism, and I tend to see American unilateralism uh, whatever. You know, we can talk about what that is, but as an inevitable outgrowth of the end of the Cold War, mm -hmm. um, that it really began in the 90, in the 89 to 91 period. What am I talking about? Well, <laughs> if you remember, during the Clinton years, um, there's a, a rejection of uh, or a turning against some international treaties. In some cases, this is led by the Republicans in Congress. There's a a test, uh, comprehensive test ban treaty that the Clinton administration tries to get through and doesn't. This, this can be laid at the, at the feet of the Republicans, but not always. 
Um, there, the Clinton administration did not want to support a landmine treaty um, that many of the Europeans were supporting. It did not want to support the International Criminal Court. It did so only in Clinton's last weeks as a lame duck. Um, and that can't be laid at the feet of the Republicans. This was the Clinton administration itself. It was, the Clinton administration was under pressure from and you know, carrying water for the Pentagon, which had a series of objections both to the criminal court and to the landmine treaty. But it, it tells you that this, this pressure, this, this trend, drift, call it whatever you will, mm -hmm. uh, towards unilateralism is more than simply a matter of, of the Bush administration, the Bush, uh, George W. Bush administration. Uh, certainly their responses to September 11th uh, heightened uh, that trend by quite a bit, but it was there. Mm -hmm. what, what about the continuities in, in terms of this other uh, dimension of, of the Vulcan philosophy? Or it's one of the elements you discussed, but this, this, this uh, Straussian-influenced idea of good and evil, of America's special place in the world, of the transformative quality of the American democratic ideal. Not all of those are Straussian ideas, but the disciples have, have played with them. They, they were apparent in, in some kind of incipient state in the struggle about human rights in the Soviet Union. They, they came more and more to emerge in the, uh, the Republican definition of how we won the Cold War. Uh, it's an idea that, that's kind of present in some of Clinton's interventions, basically, that we can go in there and clean up the House and, and, and create democracies and so on. So, so this is another continuous line that, that really goes back to Wilson, if we want to go back uh, long ago in American history, that, that reflects a continuity uh, that is also implicit and that is not new with Bush. Is that is that a fair reading? Here? That's that's definitely um, the um, the one piece of the of of the history of this good and evil approach that that uh, I see as important that could have been on your on your list. Mm -hmm. uh, really, the the the, uh, the key moment uh, for this Manichaean good and evil approach is Ronald Reagan branding the Soviet mm -hmm. Union the evil empire. Um, and uh, American presidents had tended not to use language like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Reagan was willing to do it, and that, was, um, that really crystallized the willingness uh, of, of um, American presidents, certainly more, more Reagan and, um, and the current George W. Bush than others. Um, but that, that strand, uh, particularly um, for the Republicans who've tended to link um, this uh, uh, invocation of American ideals with the use of force mm -hmm. uh, or threatened use of force, has been there right along since the, the early 80s at least. And when, when you speak of the Straussian theme, I, sh you know, I should say, if you, if you look at the intellectual roots mm -hmm. of some of the people in this administration, I do try and trace through in the book mm -hmm. um, the evolution of uh, Paul Wolfowitz, certainly the, the, the uh, leading um, uh, idea man for the neoconservatives in this administration. Uh, and Wolfowitz, who was the son of a, of a mathematician, um, had really, as an undergraduate uh, at Cornell University, um, had studied with, uh, with Alan Bloom, who was one of uh, Leo Strauss's. Leo Strauss was an emigre uh, philosopher at the University of Chicago. Bloom had studied with him. I think Bloom writes that the, you know, one of the greatest moments in his life was when Reagan called the Soviet Union an, an evil empire. Um, Wolfowitz studied with him. He studied at the University of Chicago uh, in graduate school. Uh, and he, although he really didn't study directly under Leo Strauss, he maintained, he, he really developed some of the, uh, or, or took on some of the Straussian ideas. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess, uh, it, especially in the figure of Wolfowitz, what becomes important is that this, uh, this you, you are wedding this unbalanced American power 
unmatched American power, primarily military, with a set of ideas that gives you a, a rationale for, for action in the world using military power. It, it, it all comes together rather nicely, it, it yeah. would seem. Yes, it, yeah. Um, we need to bring in here um, the neoconservatives. Yeah. I think I think it's um, it's worth mentioning. And you know, by now and sort of across the parlors of American neocons is sort of pe people talk about the neocons without really understanding uh, uh, what they are, who they, where they came from. Um, I find sometimes when I listen to people talk about neocons, it's almost a tautology. You ask people, "What's a neocon?" A neocon is someone who supported the war in Iraq. Well. Um, mm -hmm. n not quite. Uh, well, the neoconservatives, is, uh, I talked about this strain of thought in the 70s of opposition to detente. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a, a group of neoconservative intellectuals who certainly uh, felt that the United States should be um, opposing detente, that it was, it was a, um, really a violation of American values. Um, to be accommodating the Soviet Union. Uh, and, but the idea of democracy was not quite part of it. Mm -hmm. And I try to describe in the book, uh, the neoconservatives were, spent a lot of time attacking, criticizing the Carter administration. Well, part of their critique, um, understandably from everything we've said, was they didn't like his policies towards the Soviet Union. But as part of that, they criticized Carter for pushing the Shah of Iran to democratize, mm -hmm. uh, something, you know, sort of the opposite of their policies on the Middle East today. Uh, and as Re Ronald Reagan takes office, in, in the early years of the Reagan administration, there's these, there are these submerged tensions, I think people didn't see it at the time, um, between Reagan and some of his supporters who, want, you know, were, uh, wanted to challenge the Soviet Union but weren't really interested in spreading democracy. And another group of people within his administration who really took the democratic ideals seriously. You know, mm -hmm. um, they, all, they all could agree on Eastern Europe, right? Um, but you get to the late Reagan administration and you get a huge uh, division on the Philippines in which Reagan himself says, look, I want to support Ferdinand Marcos and uh, several other people in his administration, um, including the neoconservatives, uh, as a matter of principle, say, look, um, on, as if, if, if the United States is interested in democracy in Eastern Europe, it needs to be interested in democracy in Asia, too. That's a fundamental turning point for the neoconservatives. And you find from then on, increasingly, it's Philippines, South Korea, China, Burma, uh, sometimes successfully, the last two cases certainly not successfully, they are pushing uh, for democracy in Asia, and it doesn't take long, of course, for them to be pushing for democracy in the Middle East as well. Now, in, in this period, and as we're coming to the conclusion of the interview, the, the interesting things is that the, the, the Democratic Party's ideas of responding to the Vietnam War, which you discussed it, by the end of this period, they're, they're sort of gone from the picture basically. And, and after the 2004 uh, election, you wrote a very interesting article where you, uh, in, in essence, put on the table the notion that uh, the Democrats were failing to respond to two questions that, uh, uh, that were on the table uh, that, that followed from what the Republicans had done. One was, do they agree with the primacy of, of military power? In, in our foreign policy on the one hand, and or, on the other hand, do they believe that our security is ensured by transforming uh, uh, failed, uh, failing, and assorted other states into American-like democracies? And we, in a way, we don't have an answer to either of those two questions that you posed. And Kerry didn't answer those questions in 2004. I think you were suggesting. I think it's one of, yeah, that's what was one of his failings, that he really f failed to provide answers to these fundamental questions. And I must say, I don't, I don't quite see it yet. I find uh, this is, this is a, a crude analogy, but it's almost like watching the Republicans on, uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s on Social Security, where they just didn't have an answer. Mm -hmm. um, they sometimes they would say they, they couldn't quite oppose. 
uh, but they couldn't quite support. Um, and they just didn't know what to do. Well, I find on, on issues of one, uh, use of force, and two, American values, that the Democrats just haven't thought it through and come up with, with an alternative vision yet. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the, there were two, uh, when I read the books and several of your uh, recent articles, uh, two words uh, uh, come up uh, often, not often, but uh, enough for me to make note of them, and they are the words irony and fortuna. I, I don't know if you use the word fortuna, but, but in, these, in, in, the, in this, this portrait that you've been painting over the years in these books and in your articles, the, the picture of, of foreign policy and diplomacy and so on, you, you've encountered a, a lot of irony and uh, the, the working of fortune. On, on fortune, I'm, I'm thinking of the fluke that led to Rumsfeld at the last minute becoming Secretary of Defense because of a reaction to, uh, to a press conference that uh, uh, had been given when Colin Powell was appointed Secretary of State. We don't, we don't need to go into the particulars. I'm yep. more interested in having you comment on, on uh, uh, irony and fortuna as a, as a man who comes from all of this and didn't go to medical school but decided to become a writer. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> because it seems to be what great writers are always uh, where they land with those two uh, big picture items? Um, one, um, I mean, I, I, irony is very important to me. Um, I, I just, uh, in my own experience, uh, you, I don't think you can't go through life without a sense of irony, without running into it. In, uh, in covering, either, whether it's day-to-day -day events or writing books, um, you can't help, uh, if, you, if you step back from any particular moment, you often find reason to laugh mm -hmm. uh, at the turnabouts <laughs> mm -hmm. that all sides make. Um, I should say, uh, let me give you a, a, an example. Uh, when uh, the, the current Bush administration put together and put down, this was led by Condoleezza Rice, its national security strategy in 2002. Uh, this was an effort to put down the under, underlying principles that were guiding its policy. And at one point in, in trying to explain how dangerous Al-Qaeda was, and really it was, it was something that needed no explanation, but for some reason they wrote, uh, in, in contrast to the, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was a a stable status <laughs> quo power. And I looked at that and I couldn't help but laugh mm -hmm. because many of the, of the people, the Republican office holders, people like Dick Cheney, the neoconservatives, had at the time before uh, 91 or 89 certainly not conceded that the Soviet Union was a stable status quo power, quite the reverse. Mm -hmm. Now I have to say on the other side, I don't know how many times I've heard uh, uh, nice, good-thinking, straightforward Democrats since all through the 90s. One of the lines I heard was, um, we're really adrift in our foreign policy now. At least during the Cold War, we all had a unity of purpose. <laughs> and I used to chuckle at that one because, you know, you'd think and you'd say, well, wait a minute, there were tremendous arguments. There was no unity of purpose during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. There was tremendous disagreement about what the, how the United States should respond to the Soviet Union. So that, that, that sense of irony, I think you need to, as a, as a writer, you need to preserve. One, one final question. Uh, 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 what would you advise students who want to uh, uh, get into both reporting and reporting on diplomatic and international affairs. Uh, any advice for them how they should plan their future? Um, f on diplomatic affairs, I think the more uh, both American foreign policy, but especially history you can read, mm -hmm. the better. I mean, the, the, the uh, myth um, in the press corps is that you need, don't need to know a lot of history or that it doesn't help. Uh, in fact, it does all the time. And people who understand whether it's, whether it's Russian or Chinese history or history of the Middle East, uh, people who understand the history understand current events. Um, the second, how to, get, how to get into reporting, you know, 
uh, it's painful to me to watch the, n the number of available jobs, uh, at least with regular newspapers uh, and TV outlets, is uh, less and less than it used to be. Uh, you know, all I can say is, is try and find that, that starting job and keep going, but that, that's nice, uh, nice advice and it's hard to do. James, on that uh, note, we'll thank you very much for uh, coming thank to Berkeley and, and sharing your thoughts on, on the rise of the Vulcans. Thank, thank you. you, Harry. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Uh,